number of films lately that have been using long, long take, um, extremely complex choreography that they rehearse for weeks and weeks, such mm -hmm. as The Tribe, the Ukrainian film. Did you see The Tribe? Oh, yeah. Um, so in The Tribe, they were shooting 35 that they rehearsed with a digital camera, maybe two or three weeks for each 10 minute scene, which was usually, you know, just like you guys, you guys just broke into sequences, and there'd be four or five or six scenarios within one shot. And they piece it together with maybe eight to 10 sequences. So I, I'm just curious, from your DP standpoint and working with other directors, do you think there's a resurgence, a rebirth of the long take or deep focus, you know, Orson Welles um, style that was popular in the 80s with Jarmusch and a lot of German directors? Um, I feel like with DSLRs, shallow focus and lots of shots have become the style. And maybe the next reaction, are we returning to a long take deep focus scenario? Have you seen other work like this? Um, I'm not uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I think I think that there's always been a fascination for uh, for the long take, for the, the long sequence shot, and and for as a cinematographer, that's also something we really enjoy doing because we uh, all the elements of the filmmaking you can't really manipulate too much with it. It has to be uh, there in the moment. Um, I think. Um, uh, the technology today makes it even more accessible uh, for not just professional filmmakers but also for amateur filmmakers to, to experiment and and uh, hopefully uh, we will see some more good stuff uh, like that. I'm, I'm not sure if it's if it's like the way it's going or tendencies. Uh, I don't know too much about that. Um, but I will say, I mean, we didn't, when we did Victoria, we didn't look at too much at other uh, one takes of films or, or, or long shots uh, like that. We, we kind of didn't want to be too uh, influenced by other, uh, other work. Uh, I think what we also talked a lot about it was not to, to make it feel too orchestrated. We didn't want to to plan like a, a specific uh, moves or uh, uh, what do you call it? Like, it wasn't planned like cues and, and then marks and uh, we wanted it to feel more like you're in the in the moment and 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 that and that gave us a lot of freedom. Also, the actors were improvising a lot, and, and I was improvising, trying to keep up the. The director told me I should try to work like a war photographer. That was kind of his only uh, what, what he told me the first time we met. So I we'll tried to live up to that and, and just be there and try to catch the moment as, as it's kind of unfolded. Yeah. Can you talk about kind of the whole rehearsal process and then the capturing process of the film, how it worked from the beginning? Um, so the rehearsal period and then the actual how you shot it? Um, yeah, we we, uh, we had a pre-production that was maybe six weeks, and three of those weeks we, we split the film into two parts, uh, at, I think ten different sequences, and we rehearsed that as um, as we were shooting a film that we could also edit. So so if the one take uh, we had three shots of that, and if that failed, then we had material to make uh, an edited version of the film because uh, we were. You know, going on, on, on unknown territory, so we weren't sure if it, it was if it was going to work. Um, so basically, there was a 12-page uh, treatment uh, that the director wrote, and that was what we had to work with. And, and we spent a lot of time finding the right locations that had to be, you know, be close to each other, um, so it was possible to move around uh, through the film without, you know, spending 20 minutes from one place to the other. Uh, so that was a, a lot of work, and, and we also kind of had to rewrite the script uh, to make s certain scenes fit uh, into that concept. And the rehearsing uh, was also like a, both like an editing process and a script writing process, uh, where we, 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 you know, we would uh, start rehearsing the scene, and I would you know, try to uh, just move around and learn how the actors were moving and, and what they were, you know, the importance of the scenes. And, and we, um, 
we would, you know, look at that and, and change stuff and edit things together and, you know, discuss with the actors and the crew, you know, and, and that's kind of how the film developed. So by the end of the rehearsals, we had a, a, a kind of a finished edited film, and then we had a chance to do it three times more. So it was it was a really interesting process. So in kind of talking about the fact that you had to work as you know, a war photographer in that sense, were there, I guess it's kind of a two-part question, uh, were there times where you just felt kind of strangled by, um, by kind of being set into that, that you were kind of followed, that you didn't have time to like get into that one frame you really wanted to have, or was it something that you actually, because of the fact that it was just one thing after another that you felt a certain freedom, uh, with the whole thing instead of it. And then kind of the second part is, are there any particular sequences that were from, uh, uh, well, I guess sequences that didn't make it into the film that you were like, this was this was great, but unfortunately it didn't make it. If you can kind of talk about that. Um, sorry, no, I, I remember the first part of the question was. <laughs> uh, did you ever feel kind of strangled oh, yeah. by the process? Or uh, was it, uh, um, maybe uh, in the beginning I was kind of uh, worried that it would be, you know, feel that it wasn't, uh, you know, a little stronger. But but I felt uh, no, I, I felt uh, like it was it was giving me a, a huge amount of freedom, and uh, and uh, the director was very encouraging. And, you know, you know, you can't really make mistakes here because. Uh, everything we sh you, know, sh you shoot is going to be part of the movie, so uh, all the kind of small faults and mistakes, you just have to kind of you know make them a part of, of this film, and that gave me a lot of confidence that you know I I wasn't going to fuck up, you know. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, so I, I felt a huge amount of freedom, and, and that was you know, and, and the director also encouraged me to be brave and take chances and and think out of the box and, and try to frame, uh, you know, not be too conservative in my framing and, and just play around with the, with the focus and, and do whatever I felt was right for the, for the scene. And, and that was extremely liberating. Uh, and it made me connect a lot to, to the characters because I could, you know, not think too much about okay, yeah, the light isn't perfect here or uh, you know, this move wasn't great, or but I could really just you know connect and, and to into their emotions, uh, and I really felt a part of, of that group of, of friends that really the 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 lead uh, Laia Costa. And she she told me uh, that she had kind of looked at me after or when she was off screen off uh, off screen um, or off camera. And I had, you know, I, I was filming and I was laughing because the guys were being funny, and I, I can't even remember that. So, so I really, yeah, I think I was just tapped into their, their what they were doing as much as they were themselves. They had to kind of live that. Yeah. Because the camera is almost like another character, which makes you, as the audience, a character in their adventure. Um, and, but your camera's always where it needs to be, looking at who it needs to, you know, what the action is and what they're looking at, and their kind of their perspective. Was that something you just kind of, by getting into it, you did that, or was that something that the director brought to you? Um, no, I, I, we didn't really discuss uh, specific uh, things that I had to, to catch. There were, well, there were some moments that we knew were important, uh, uh, but it wasn't, we didn't, you know, we need a white check here, or we need, um, we tried to choreograph it as little as possible, but we also wanted it to have some dynamic. Thing. So, uh, so I tried to during rehearsals, I kind of learned the language of the film, uh, and, and then when, once we were doing it, it was just you know jumping into it and then try to do the, the best I could. Back here. Um, I might be jumping ahead a little bit in this question, but when you were filming this last shot. What were you like? What were the emotions in you? Were you just like euphoric, or, or were you like, okay, now it's done? <laughs> or you, what did you, what did you think? You mean like right after? Like, 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 like what? Like twenty seconds before you knew it was gonna be a cut. Uh, I was fuckless to it again. <laughs> 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 uh, I felt actually that the first 
the first take we did was, was really good technically, and things worked uh, you know, beyond my imagination. Because yeah, then we were really you know, scared that we wouldn't be able to finish from the beginning to end. And once we kind of had that and, and everything worked, and, you know, it, was, it was great. Uh, but for the third take, I think also because then we had our expectations were building up, um, I, I thought there were some, some, you know, some things that didn't work as well as the first take, so I was kind of like, ah, we should, we should do it again. So it was a couple of three takes? Three takes, yeah. Um, and we chose the last one, which was the best film, absolutely, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the challenges of uh, doing long takes like that? And if you could change anything, what would be some of the stuff that you might change about it? Technically, on your, on your side. Uh, Difficult questions. I mean, uh, it's the challengers are, you know, it are immense. I think because the log log logistics of it is really complicated. Uh, just having, uh, just lighting, you know, uh, the whole film uh, for one take is is complicated and it takes a lot of time and planning uh, and and. and there are so many details that, that just needs to work. Like the, the actors, they're doing their own makeup during the filming, putting blood on themselves and, and sweat. And uh, um, there's a scene where, where the, some guys take off the clothes and they take off the, mi the microphone, they need to put that back on. And, and at one point, it's the guy who got. And so there's all these small details that just need to work. And it's, very yeah, it's difficult, complicated, and I don't know what I would change. Probably a bunch of things, but yeah, I'd rather not think about it. <laughs> you ever want to do it again? That's a uh, no, I don't think it would be again. <laughs> it's not because it was a bad experience. It's just, you, know, you need new other challenges. Yeah. Very good. So when when you did the three takes, uh, was it always uh, the wee hours of the morning till daylight, or did you just start? Did you do them all at the same time? How, how, when did you do the three takes? Um, we, we planned it so that uh, once they go into the garage, that's kind of the midpoint of the film, uh, they, they were supposed to go into this underground garage thing uh, at, at night when it was dark and come out when it was light. Okay, that was, that was the plan. So we had kind of a, a very short window and we knew exactly the, the time when we had to start. Uh, to kind of make it there while it was still dark, um, but of course we knew that you know we just if if the actors took longer or came there faster, we couldn't really control that uh, in, in detail. So you just worked with your location, said we just need three days to have this stuff kind of set up and in place, and then we'll. Or how many days did you set aside for it? Um, for the actual takes. Well, we had one 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 day for each uh, each yeah. day, so we shot in the morning as well, uh, or we started night to the day, and, and and just yeah, clearing all the locations for those different because uh, uh, I think there's more than twenty locations and, and dressing them and lighting them. So it does a big job over time. It's, it's not it's not cheaper for the producers <laughs> to make a one take film. <laughs> Even though they think, yeah, it just takes two hours, you're done. <laughs> uh, yeah, another one, I, I noticed when you were in the car, the windows were all steamed up. Is that because of all the bodies and the breath in there, and you had to keep the windows closed for sound? <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. And, and the, what, the air conditioner was turned the wrong way, or, you know, there's <laughs> so many little things, yeah. small details that you don't really think about. Now. Yeah. When he, he steals the car, we had a guy you know, lying on the floor of the car pressing the, with the emergency button so it would blink, you know, when he hit. Okay. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you plan for the changing in atmosphere? I'm curious, like, from one scene, you know, obviously you kind of have to maintain a certain exposure and depth of feel and how you kind of plan, you know, and what you did to, to, to balance all that out. Um, you mean lighting-wise? Yeah, yeah, yeah lighting wise. and sound and, yeah. and you know, keeping the depth of field right and the focus and all that. And, 
Um, well, we, we didn't approach it too differently to a, a normal shoot. I mean, every location uh, I had a you know a vision of how it was going to be. Uh, the, the cafeteria was I wanted that to be very intimate and kind of warm, and and the, the garage I wanted that to be be very cool and kind of harsh. Um, so and that's kind of how I always approach uh, different locations. So we would change. We wouldn't set up too much light, but we would kind of work with what was there. Uh, we would change the, the tubes uh, that was already there to get the right color, and we would maybe turn off some lights on the streets and, and put up some we put up some billboards around so, just so there was always some light in the background that would fall off in the faces. And uh, uh, and exposure-wise, it was. Uh, it was tricky, but I was I was also uh, using opening up the lens and, and closing it down and turning the MD filters on and off. And, uh, just to, yeah, because we go from from night to day, so obviously light intensity increases a lot. Yeah, so that, that was also a tricky thing. Yeah. I can imagine so. What did you shoot it on? Uh, Canon C300. I, I how did you, how did nobody technical get in the shot? How did you manage not to get somebody that should have been in the shot, not in the shot? Right? Yeah. You know, I didn't see, I didn't see you in a mirror or a, you know, a window or anything. I, I didn't, I didn't catch that. And yet there were a lot of people, it's presuming technically, around the whole time. Yet there was no, I had no sense of anything other than what was captured. Yeah, well, that's that's good because because <laughs> <laughs> it's not true, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we, um, we we try to be as, as few, few people around the camera as, as possible. We, you know, we like a documentary shoot basically, uh, uh, and and anyone else that had to be there, kind of keeping their distance uh, a little bit. And I think we learned through the rehearsals that um, you know that how, where the director should be, so we can interfere with. with with, it, with the camera, uh, and, and but still he could kind of keep a little bit control of the situation. And there were there, you know, there were some reflections uh, where, you, where you can see me or the boomer, and I, I think also the boomer was in frame one point. And, but we worked with that digitally and, and removed a lot of it. Um, that's of course team, but <laughs> couldn't get around that. <laughs> um, and, uh, but there are also, there was an incident where, I also think I said it's in the Q&A, there was a couple of, of drunk Russians that kind of stormed in because the guy's having a panic attack and they thought he was, you know, in need of help and didn't think that, you know, there was a camera there. And so they, they almost ruined the shot by kind of interfering there, but the director managed to, to kind of keep them out of the shot. Um, was that the take you used? Yeah, yeah. And kind of dovetailing with that, how much like stabilization and, and color correction was there, uh, you know, in, in post production? Was there quite a bit of that to do, or sorry, was there quite a bit of that to do? I would imagine, you know. Yeah, there's not too much uh, image stabilization because we were shooting, uh, you know, it's not a it's not a 4K image, so we couldn't really zoom too much into it and. and uh, and it is rough, you know, the, the style of it is rough. And uh, we did a little bit of fitting here and there, but not that much. Uh, we calibrated the film, of course. Uh, but we didn't do too much digital work and afterwards. We were mostly trying to you know, remove those obvious uh, reflections. Uh, there's still a lot of shadows of the camera and uh, if you we look for those things, <laughs> but, uh, and we we did one sky replacement on top of the roof. We put in a little bit of, of clouds. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, well, the uh, the youth media force at Asian Media Access is looking to do a PC that uh, it's that's gonna have that. It's gonna be shorter, but it's gonna have a particular um, uh, uh, event and setting where they're going to move from one setting to another, but tracking that way. Is there any particular experience that you, as a DP, that you might be able to give to the camera person? Is there, is there any uh, technique that you use in tracking, you know, making sure that the person is in frame the way you like it, or anything that you've learned that may be useful? 
I'm not sure what's the scene or what's the... They're looking to attract some uh, youth from playing soccer outside into a, a home where they're going to be doing some art and into like a dance studio where they're going to be dancing. And it's going to be for a, a bicultural healthy living um, PCA activity. So in that case, is there any te techniques that you utilize um, as a DP uh, to keep the uh, subject in frame or to you know keep the right pacing, um, keep the right uh, you know uh, depth so they're in focus. Any anything in particular that you learned that you did there on set that um, that you didn't beforehand that you might be able to pass down. You know. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's a kind of difficult question I think because uh, I don't know the circumstances of the of the shot like, and, and, and uh, it might be very kind of technical stuff but I think it, you know, most important for me in every shoot is is not to worry too much about the the technical uh, I'm I'm not super technical either uh, so uh, I I I just try to connect with what what the scene is all about and and if it's if it's uh, one, you know, a tracking shot, or it, it kind of needs to come from somewhere, uh, like moving the camera when, uh, when when there's a reason for it. And, and, but yeah, I'm, it's, it's I think sorry, I'm <laughs> not answering your question very well. But well, one thing you, you talked about last night was that there was your camera system was there, sort of the opening doors and stuff. So you, all you had to do was look through the camera. Everything was sort of else taken care of for you. Uh, yeah, 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 I, yeah, most of yeah, yeah. So you were just reluctant. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't. I, I kind of had to watch my step and I yeah. walk up the stairs and, and stuff like that. So I had a. I was using the eyepiece as much as possible, uh, looking through the camera, um, because that also kind of helps me uh, you know, stabilize the camera. Actually, uh, maybe that that could yeah. be. <laughs> that's 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 um, with doing handheld stuff, but I also had a small monitor on top of the camera, so. So for example, when I was running, I had to shift grip, so I was hold, not holding the camera by the side handle, but the top handle, so I could, because uh, running like this, it's <laughs> never going to work, so. Yeah. Um, and then you had, you had uh, several cr crews in each of the locations? Yeah. So that uh, well, I had the, the focus puller was kind of with me uh, until the locations where he, he couldn't really fit or we felt that it was it, he would you know take up too much space or be in the way of the boom or, or like in the car uh, he obviously couldn't be there uh, so so he would you know he would get on a bike and kind of bike to the next location and then wait for me come out of around the corner and, and take over the focus um, and yeah so that was so part of all the logistics of it. And I had I had some some people opening the car before me and tapping my shoulder when I was ready to get in. And I tried to keep you know my eye both eyes open by looking to the viewfinder, so I could also keep an eye on what was going on around me. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I would be too focused on. Um, I'm just a friend. So if there's no men, they're going to be in danger, right? <laughs> Sorry. So if there's no men to just a camera, they're going to be in danger, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about your background? I mean, you've got a pretty extensive camera career right now. Can you talk about how you got started in this business? Um, yeah, I, 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 was, I started uh, in getting an interest for, uh, for a film uh, when I was around 19. Uh, and I, I went to a sort of a pre-film pre school. It's like a one-year course where you got like an introduction to, to various uh, like that sound and cinematography and I reckon we can try a little bit of both and, and I was fascinated by, by the image and I also did a lot of uh, sound work actually there because I was in music and music and then I, I went to art school uh, and did you know, a bachelor in fine arts and, and, and did all sorts of silly experiments with uh, video and, and film uh, and, and while I was in art school, I started working as a camera assistant. Um, and I yeah, got some nice friends that was in the business and, and kind of helped me. And I applied for film school the year after I finished uh, art school, and, and I graduated in 2011. What was your first feature? It was um, 
uh, is a Danish produced film uh, called I Am Here, uh, shot in, in, uh, in Hamburg with, uh, with Kim Basinger as the lead. And uh, Sebastian Schipper, who directed Victoria, was acting in that film, and that's how we met. <laughs> Shot. 
so so there's maybe a connection to, <laughs> to, to how I like to work or what interests me. Back here. On Victoria, what file format did you shoot, and how long was your 140 minute tape? I mean, how much storage space did that take up? <laughs> um, the file format, I'm not very technical. It's whatever the Canon C300 shoots <laughs> up. <laughs> we, we, we didn't shoot on external recorder, it was all on a 64D white card. Uh, I think it takes, it can run for about two and a half hour or maybe even three, I can't remember. But it was kind of we knew we couldn't, you know, shoot for much longer than those hundred and forty minutes. Right. Hmm. Yeah. I, I can have one. Um, if um if you could take a, if you could pass down anything as a DP through all your experience down to uh, some of the younger generations, what would be one of the things that you would uh, uh, that you would suggest or that you would want them to know going into this industry uh, being interested in the DP position? Um, I think, well, one thing that I, I try to do is not to, to, to copy any, anything or any particular style and also try to uh, learn from, from the mistakes, meaning that, you know, that you can kind of embrace them and, and make them, uh, you know, a mistake can can become, you know, beautiful art, you know, a fault. Uh, so I try to not to worry too much about making these mistakes and, and rather try to see it as, as a, a form of expression. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really for them. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, uh, an experiment and take chances. Not try to do stuff the way it's supposed to be done. Mm. So in a way, deviate a little bit from the traditional thing that everybody always does, right? And be original, ish. Yeah, it's kind of hard to be original because what is that? You know? But try to just be true to what you want to do yourself. I mean, if you want to do uh, stuff like uh, I don't know, uh, like big Hollywood films uh, or and of course you should you should go for that, uh, but but don't be I guess afraid to, to create your own style, you yeah. or try to live up to some expectations or standards. Now that you've gotten this award, the Silver Bear Award, which you won at Berlin for cinematography, your outstanding achievements in cinematography, um, you are going to be a, uh, a DP that people are going to be calling and looking for. Um, is there anything that you've been requested to do or you're looking at doing that's beyond what you would normally done? Um, I not well now I'm doing a, another feature in Iceland. <laughs> it's kind of a, a small budget uh, film. Uh, so, but I have you know I, now I have a have a, a agent an agent in, in LA and there's some interesting projects. That, that's coming my way from from the U.S. and I would definitely, you know, like to to go come here and, and make film as well. Um, but I think the, getting that award, you know, is is like when you come out of film school, that that kind of green lights you to do some projects, and then you do your first feature, and then it's like, okay, you can do a feature now, so you can be offered features, and then then you win an award, and then you kind of get one. That up the ladder again. So now there's you know projects that I, obviously that wouldn't have been offered if, if I hadn't won that. So it's it's kind of a shortcut, I guess. Yeah. Right here. Uh, you mentioned you have an agent in LA. Is it uncommon to have a rapper agent in Europe, or is it just what you decided to go with? It's uh, it's not that uncommon in, in Europe, but but. Uh, but if you want to shoot in, in the U.S., you need someone uh, to represent you in the U.S. Uh, there's, I think, the, the, you need lawyers and, and stuff. It's, it's a little bit more loose in, in Europe, I think. Uh, but I have a European agent. When you're working on like a low-budget film, do you feel like it it pushes you to be more creative? 
because maybe you can't, you don't have the equipment or you don't have the resources to get a specific shot. So do you find it more of a of an avenue for you to say, hmm, how can I get this shot versus, oh, I'll just throw it on this crane and swing it down, you know? I never done that. <laughs> I've only done low budget films, so <laughs> I don't have much to compare with. I've done some some commercials with with budgets like that. You can pull something in, and, and my experience from that is that that uh, you, you end up doing what you like, no matter what. I mean, we had a crane, and I took the camera on the shoulder anyway. Uh, yeah, you, you kind of want to, you know connect to, to the story somehow and, and for me that it works uh, unless it's something very specific uh, shots that I need to do. But, um, but I, I think it does. I think it pushes you to to be more true to the story when you can't just you know pull in a helicopter and and do amazing shots because uh, I think I think you rather do uh, Kind of intimate, uh, interesting shots than kind of amazing, interesting shots. That makes any sense. <coughs> Somebody around the corner? I can't see her. Oh, okay. yes, um, you spoke about finding your own style as a cinematographer, and I wondered what you consider your style, like what makes up your personal style of shooting, or how you see it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, it's, it's kind of hard to see from Because <laughs> um, as I said, I, I you know I did Victoria and the next week I was shooting a completely different style. Um, and so, um, there's probably a lot of similarity somehow, of just how you, um, how you frame and what you like to do. How, you know, how you'd like to compose your shots, um, but it's kind of hard for me to figure out. Um, when, when I started out, I, as I said, I thought I was just going to do these kind of static wide angle shots, and, and that was kind of my interest. And then I, I did one in film school, I did a film that was handheld, and I, I, I was amazed by the freedom you got from that. So, so then I kind of started. Uh, doing a lot of handle and, and, and well, now I, I get to do both. It's great. Is there anything that um, you went to film you went to art school, was there anything in art school that helped you to become what you feel better as cinematographer? I think art school learned uh, I, I learned how to kind of uh, visualize very abstract ideas. Um, and, and think more abstract about uh, images. Um, and I, I got to experiment a lot. Uh, so I think, I, yeah, I learned, I learned a lot from, from art school. Um, also just, you know, not just being into cinema, but being into the art scene and, and, and looking at paintings and performance art and the old kind of video art. It's, it's, yeah, I think it kind of expands your, uh, your artistic uh, uh, horizon. Who are a couple of your favorite visual artists? Uh, Bill Viola uh, is a video artist. Um, and uh, Edward Munch <laughs> is my favorite painter. Um, I'm sure I'm, I'm really not good at name dropping. <laughs> We, we can speak after I uh, <laughs> come up with them. <laughs> oh, uh, just wondering, as a DP in the future, do you see yourself doing any other roles also? Uh, not, not set for the moment. Uh, I'm very comfortable with DP right now. So, I, in art school, I, you know, I directed my own films, and I, I found that very lonely somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Directing, producing, filming, you know, doing all the work. So I'm, I'm very happy to be you know, part of, of the crew and kind of being the, the director's right hand in, in the, in the pre-production and shooting. Um, talk, talking about lonely, I noticed um, some of your, uh, your future projects, you travel a lot, right? Do you have a family? 
Um, and, and how do you personally uh, keep that at bay? Because <laughs> I know there's a, there's like difficulties with falling off and stuff like that. Um, I have a wife, and she's a visual artist, and, and she she travels a lot as well. So so it, it works. But yeah, it's, it's difficult. I don't have children, so I think that would make it more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so shooting, shooting handheld like obviously gives you a lot more freedom and like movement with camera and you can do a lot more than if you were on a tripod. But for someone like me, like I have horribly shaky hands, so I can't hold the camera steady to save my life. Like, if you can get any <laughs> advice towards that, like what did you ever have problems with that? Like, do, was it was there something you did like a technique or like, exercises that you did that allowed you to hold the camera like much more steadily? I mean, well, like, I think it's a lot of times. I, I like, for example, a shoulder camera. Like, even though it's heavier, it's 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 better balanced than the LX. I think it's very well balanced compared to, for example, the, the Epic, which you need to have add stuff to make it uh, balanced. And uh, I, you know, I I try to. I I I don't have the handles down here. I have them up here. Because I like to kind of really have the camera close and give support to my you know, my elbows to my chest, and I try to walk in rhythm with the actors. <laughs> you know, with their right foot first, and then you know, kind of follow that rhythm. Uh, but but otherwise, it's not really. Uh, I just try to keep it as steady as I can. I don't really exercise for anything particular to keep it steady. Just make sure you. you have a strong back and yeah, take care of that. Do you ever work with uh, steady cams or three axis gimbals or any stabilization equipment when you shoot? I, I, I haven't so far. I worked on some uh, where we use a steady cam but have an operator. You wouldn't have used a video monitor on Victoria. I can't imagine it would be useful there. But how do you use a video monitor? Shooting. Um, yeah, Victoria, we didn't have a, a, a monitor for the director uh, at all, so he was, you know, just following the action. And normally, you know, I, I operate the camera always myself. Um, and normally, we have either, you know, a small monitor for the director, and, and there's a bigger one for the for the uh, director or, or the, the script uh, and. Uh, and the, the crew that has to kind of watch the makeup and so on. I um, don't know if I answered your question. Well, there are other films that would not relate to the style of Victoria when you shoot handheld or by yourself. Do you, uh, what size monitor do you, do you use or do you watch it or do you even have time to you check out of the monitor or out of the little camera viewfinder? I, I use uh, the camera viewfinder as much as I can, yeah. And and I rarely go back and look at takes. Uh, you operating yourself, and I, I kind of feel when it's right or when it's it's not there. Uh, so after a take, I would you know discuss with the director if this was good or not, and we'll adjust to that, and because uh, because he has uh, his vision. <laughs> Through the monitor while you're shooting. The viewfinder, mostly. Or the, the, yeah. Like a seven-inch video, video monitor that's mounted on the camera. I, I don't use the monitor on the camera much. That's mostly my focus puller that, that will use that. I, I, I like to look through the viewfinder because it, feel, it feels like the camera then is a part of you more than because you're actually pressing against it. So he looks through the eyepiece? Yeah. The eyepiece, yeah. Any other questions? So, have you shot any uh, features in film? No. Okay. I'm just curious. A documentary feature I shot on black and white 16. Yeah. Just recently. Yeah. And did, was it any kind of different experience? Yeah, it was horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I was just checking my light meter all the time, you know, before. But it's great. It's also great. And the material comes back and it looks great. And, and you just, yeah, you, you get this, yeah, kind of thing. And, uh, 
So uh, yeah, we were great shooting on film. We shot a lot of film in, in, in film school, but uh, in, in, in Denmark or in Europe, we don't really shoot film anymore. It's kind of, it just disappeared really fast. Um, a lot of filmmakers usually recommend shooting flat. Um, I noticed you said earlier that you guys didn't do much in color grading on post. The GAs really like shot for the feel of what you guys want as the after after ready, or uh, did you guys shoot it flat? Um, we sh I mean we shot it flat like a C log I think it's called so it's so we we can work with the color grading uh, as much and we graded it pretty hard. I, I actually I tend to be a little bit more conservative concerning colors and, and contrast than Victoria, but I, I also wanted this film to have a that's kind of punch. Um, but I I normally I never look at the flat image because I wanna I wanna expose for more like a graded image because you kind of that's where you end up anyway. So I'd rather you know not rely too much on the on the flat image. So in camera you did do some tweaking based on exposure and like Sharpness. No, the camera is just set to, I don't know, you know, C line. I'm, I'm really not technical. There's, I have really good health with, with that. <laughs> so I don't have to worry too much myself. Yeah. Right here. Just curious to know how much information you have in your viewfinder. Do you, do you use zebra stripes, for example, for overexposure or peaking to confirm focus, or is any of that in your viewfinder? Uh, peaking, I use peaking because I, I, when I do the focus myself, uh, I think that's a really helpful tool. I don't do zebra stripes because uh, um, I kind of, you know, I, I have a look at uh, where the exposure is and if it's. If it's burning out uh, the highlights, then you know, it's already too late. <laughs> <laughs> and the zebra side is just annoying me. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts? Way in the back there? No, you. Yeah. Um, as a uh, kind of a question, more of like a personal thing for you, as like a preference. When you're on set in, like, obviously the DP has a very, very close relationship with the director on set, but is there someone on set for you that's like that second person that you can just always rely on or that you always talk to that just like helps you get what you need and gets it done? The, ga the gaffer. Yeah. Yeah. I always try to bring on gaffers that I, I know and, and maybe they're not the, the most, you know, experienced or the, the best gaffers, but it's really important to me that we have a good kind of connection that we can, you know, just hang out and be friends as well. Uh, same goes for the focus puller, but I, I used to gaffer most uh, during the shoot. Will? Yeah, I'm curious, uh, and probably the, the least uh, experienced with the medium of anybody, but I'm a big old film nerd. Uh, considering how, how web-centric and social media-centric our world is, uh, a, uh, are you on Twitter? And B, but most importantly, if so, uh, can uh, can yes. folks learn yes. uh, of, of your craft uh, via Twitter? I'm, I'm very sorry to disappoint. I, I'm not on Twitter, and I, I have I don't I've never yeah. read or seen or tweeted. That's it. Or uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, well, <coughs> I'm on Facebook. I think that's. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so folks can follow you on Facebook and perhaps learn from you that way if they can't meet you often like this. Uh, I don't know how much you would learn from me. <laughs> on Facebook. Uh, you would probably see an update once in a while that this film or shot is now in this festival or screening here. Yeah. So, no, sorry. I'll make a vlog. <laughs> Is there any uh, particular films in this festival that you're eager to see or yeah. have interest in? Uh, I haven't really had that much chance to look at the program uh, yet. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I need to do that. Uh, I have some friends, uh, which are, they're screening a film called Perfect Park, which, which I'm, uh, I wish I could watch. But I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow, so I can catch that. Uh, it's a documentary shot in the US.
You said you've done uh, documentaries before. Can you talk a little bit about the subject matters and how you got into that? Well, when I came out of film school, uh, I, the, the directors that I, I was in film school with, they, the, the ones that wanted to do fiction, they, they tend to spend more time getting their projects uh, 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 produced. And, uh, but the documentary filmmakers, they just, you know, just go out and do it. So I did a lot of, of that right after film school. And, uh, and I, um, usually on documentaries, at least in Denmark, you, you're more than one uh, cameraman uh, doing it. So, so I was working with a lot of other people as well. And I did, uh, and then I did one feature length documentary uh, called The Agreement, which is a political documentary about the conflict between Kosovo and, and Serbia. And it's actually about this negotiator in Brussels in the EU, which, and he's negotiating, negotiating a deal between these two parts. Uh, and they're very eccentric, uh, the, the Serbian negotiator and, and the Kosovo. So it's kind of a, a humoristic political documentary um, about something uh, very serious, I guess. And then I did a documentary in New York called Songs for Alexis um, by a Danish director, and it's about a transgender teenager. Uh, and it's a love story. He, he meets a girl, and they fall in love. Uh, and, but um, her family doesn't approve. So it's, yeah. Nice, nice little thing. You can find it on iTunes. Anybody else? We got time for a couple more questions. Go ahead. Genre-wise, genre -wise, what kind of what genre would you uh, prefer to shoot? Um, and what genre don't you like? And will you give it a try? <laughs> um, I, I don't really think about genre too much. I think I like drama. Uh, genre. Uh, and. Uh, I don't think there's anything I wouldn't do if, if the script is, is interesting and challenging. Uh, and, uh, right here, question? Right here? Somebody? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if anyone has discussed with you the great rebates we have in Minnesota for shooting here and our wonderful location. <laughs> yeah, of course, I've been... Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'll pass that on to Denmark. It'll be swarming. We got time for one more question. Yeah, one around the corner. Oh, okay. Sorry. Right. Um, what's your uh, philosophy on coverage? Do you like to know how you want to frame each shot and get that framing, or do you like to give yourself and the editor options and get wide, medium, close up, or do you just know what you want to get? I think that dif different, uh, differs a lot from project to project. I, I, I'm not too crazy about the term coverage. It, it feels like you're just kind of saving it. Uh, I, I, like, I like to have a, maybe a more precise or clear vision, uh, or I like to just, you know, um, not cover, think too much about it and just kind of go in and, and on my first feature film we, we did um, we did never talk about coverage. We, we had a scene, we rehearsed it, and then we shot for maybe like a scene, just you know, going handheld between the characters, and um, and then the editor would have to you know deal with that somehow. <laughs> but it, it creates some interesting uh, stuff, though. I think it's it's a cool stuff. Uh, so yeah, but but for the Icelandic film, we, we definitely we well we planned the shots and. We, did it more, much more uh, yeah, precise and planned. But I'm not, uh, I don't think I like the, the term coverage. <laughs> well, I, got, I want to thank you for coming for this thing. I really appreciate this. <laughs>